So in this case, here you could simplify the Hamiltonian into something like this one over here. So basically, this is a two by two matrix, and there is a carry limit term over here. So in this case, actually, the four component spinor can be split into two component, uh, two two spinors with two components, and each component represents a wild fermion. So this uh, this one here represents a positive chirality wild fermion. So with right net chiral wild fermions, and then the bottom one represents a negative chiral wild fermions. So people were trying to find this wild fermions as elementary particle for a long time in high energy physics, but this has not been found as a free particle. In the beginning, people used to think that uh, neutrino is a wild fermion because uh, but later on, we found out that neutrino has a mass, so it is not a wild fermion. So there has been a lot of search, and one hint came from for a long time back in 1937 when Fermi Harry proposed that wild fermions may appear as a emergent quasi particle in condensed matter systems. What is uh, emergent quasi particle? What is emergence? So we have to understand what is emergence. So emergence means uh, suppose you have a collection of pictures like this one over here, and you want to make a uh, all these pictures are different from each other. We want to make a combined picture, so we can end up in a situation in which we have a picture which is a picture of a cat, and this picture is made from 800 different pictures of individual pictures. So you can see that by combining new different pictures, you can create a completely new kind of picture. In this case, a case of a cat, and this kind of picture is called mosaic, photographic mosaic, and this is the basis of uh, concept of emergence. So this emergence is a very uh, important concept in condensed physics. For example, in sound waves, the individual sound motions of the atoms in the rigid solid can produce a collective motion, can produce a different uh, sound waves, and uh, which can produce different partial particles called photons. Uh, called photons. So these concepts were initially introduced by 1956 by, by Lev Landau to, uh, in the Fermi liquid theory, and to, which was developed to explain liquid helium 3. So uh, this uh, emergent quasi particles are very common in condensed matter physics, and sometimes they can mimic the, uh, the uh, elementary particles in high energy physics. So this is what uh, we want to look for, the analogies in condensed matter physics and high energy physics. So the Dirac type quasi particles involved in condensed matter physics through graphene. So this was quite a long time back when Wallace in 1947 tried to solve the bench structure of graphene and by time binding model he found out this dispersion relation. And if you see this bench structure over here, you can see that the valence band and conduction band touch at the corner of the Gravian zone. And if you zoom into this uh, the first band touching point, you can see that the dispersion relation is almost linear over here. So the uh, the close to this um, band touching point, the Hamiltonian can be written by this kind of uh, Dirac Hamiltonian, except here the velocity is replaced by public velocity instead of velocity of light. And also, this, uh, for, in case of a special case of graphene, the public velocity is very, very large, almost close to the speed of light. So, all the imaging properties of graphene is because of this massless nature and the public velocity is very close to the velocity of light. So in the in case of graphene, the four component spinor can be split into two component two by spinors. So in this case, these two components represent the spinor spin degree of freedom instead of chirality. And this is because graphene is a two-dimensional material. So the base of the dispersion is also two-dimensional. So this direct dispersion is two-dimensional, it doesn't re represent the actual direct dispersion, which is three-dimensional. So that is what the people wanted to find out. Uh, if there is any material into which you can have this kind of bent touching point, but the linear dispersion should exist in all three momentum directions. So that will be a, 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 a exact analog of Dirac dispersion relations. I think for a long time, and it was initially theoretically predicted in 2012 by a Chinese group that if you have this bismuth, sodium bismuth compound, and the close to the Fermi level, there is, there is a bent touching point, and in this material, you can realize this, this kind of Dirac dispersion where the linear dispersion will exist in all three momenta directions. And later in 2014, in Lai Dasan's group, they could, uh, they could uh, experiment and verify that indeed there is a Dirac cone in this material. And so you can see here the linear dispersion exists in all three momentum directions. So this is again equivalent or analog of Dirac dispersion in three dimensions. Uh, but then what about the antiparticles? The Dirac equations also support antiparticles. But in condensed matter system, it is very trivial because the force acts as the antiparticles over here. And so it mimics. So now we have a condensed matter system which, where you can study the high energy concepts uh, that is possible only in uh, in Dirac equations. So after this material was discovered, that people also found other materials listed over here, which also has a Dirac kind of dispersion as one listed over here. So as I said, the Dirac dispersion is a uh, three-dimensional graphene. So we have a linear dispersion brought in all the three momentum directions. 
So this bent tension point here is fourfold degenerate. But now if somehow you break time reversal symmetry or special inversion symmetry, then this fourfold degenerate points can split into two twofold degenerate y points. And close to these y points, the low energy excitations follow this y hamiltonian over here. And so and you can see the side of y hamiltonian supports certain chirality. So close to this y point or y point over here. It is, there are, it is mostly occupied by electrons with positive chirality, negative chirality, and close to this wiper over here, it is electrons are mostly occupied with positive chirality. And this this white force act as source and sink of the very curvature. So while similar also another special property that is a half circle is forming in the surface. So this is a very very unusual for white semimetals and because most of the topological materials are topological the direct semimetal or topological insulators, the public surface is usually closed. But in the metals, the Fermi surface is a half circle, and half of the circle is on the top side of the surface, and other half of the circle is on the bottom side of the surface. So the way we define parallelity in this, in this condition metal system is that when the momentum and spins are parallel to each other, we call it positive parallelity or right-handed parallel fermions, and when it is in momentum and spins are anti parallel, we call it negative parallelity or uh, left-handed parallel fermions. <coughs> So this was actually wild fermions were in semi metals were first discovered in 2015 and Dahid Hassan group in Princeton University in this class of material, Tantala Marcenide, Nigel from Arsenide and Tantala Phosphide. This was a, one of the top 10 research on this kind of materials. And particularly what they did was that uh, they did a special kind of experiment that is called angle laser confirmation spectroscopy in which you can take a picture of your bench structure. So what you can see here is that they took a picture of a ball bench structure and they could see there are two wild points over here and in the tantalum arsenide and also when they do the same experiment with low energy photons so that they can only make the surface states they could see that they, there are indeed a half circle for the earth present so this experimentally confirms that we have really have a material which supports wild fermions and there are for the earth surface states present and this is the typical picture of your wild semi metals so this is a tantalum arsenide picture so this material looks like another like piece of iron or something like that but uh, this material is very special because it supports uh, high energy uh, direct fermions, uh, wild fermions inside this material. And until now, most of the research in this field has been done on this kind of rocks. So to, to move ahead, what we need to do is that we need to fabricate devices. So we need to move to thin films and make more those devices. Then only we can make use of this exotic property of this material. Uh, this is what I want to explore in the next couple of years in my research group. So that so the, then the question appears, how many wild semi-metals are there? Like what is going on? Like how, is there a large number of wild semi-metals? So in 2019, what I said was like, uh, people did a lot of uh, research on to find out how many wild semi-metals are there, like how many topological materials are there in this nature actually. So there are a lot of series of nature papers that come out. And uh, right now actually, after all these studies, we have now a catalog. So we have a catalog, you can log into this website and find out whether your material is topological or not. So, uh, we have actually the, now we have a catalog of scan all the inorganic materials and you can literally find out which is a uh, wild semi metal and which is not. So, the main point of this uh, investigation is that almost 27% of all the materials in the world are topological, and 12% are topological insulators, and 15% are topological semi metals. So, that means we have more topological semi metals than topological insulators. So, you can see that topological semi metals are definitely going to be uh, very useful for future applications because we have more topological semi metals. On top of that, topological insulator has a lot of problems because to fabricate topological insulators, you have to make a high quality single crystals so that the bond remains insulating and the surface remains conducting. So it is a big problem in topological insulators. But in topological semi metals, it is not a problem because the uh, topological nature is present in the bond based structure. So you don't have to worry about making high quality samples, even you can get away with very poor quality samples. 27% so of all the materials. All the inorganic materials. Existing materials. Yes. Yeah, all materials or all kinds of materials? All the inorganic materials that has been in the all material the database. database. So there are around 2,000 some materials they scanned, and based on the symmetry considerations, they could figure out that uh, they do not do the actual band cast calculation of all the 2,400 materials. So they do consider some symmetry calculations, so do some algorithms to find out oh, this symmetry means this should be topological. And this is how they determine this, is, uh, this estimation number. Yes, yes. So, 
Yeah, so Ashwin Bishwan has predicted that bilateral irrigates is the first uh, uh, wild semi metal. It is a magnetic wild semi metal. But uh, it was very difficult to synthesize. And then, because it is a magnetic material, there are multiple domains. So, people tried a lot of experiments to verify it is a wild semi metal or not. But still, it has not been verified to be a wild semi metal. Uh, and it could be verified by us. Simpler material. Simpler material. But uh, sodium bismuth has a lot of problems. It is oxidizes very quickly. Uh, it oxidizes as soon as it comes to air. air. Whereas paracol irrigates will be very stable because they are oxides. So that is a very good material. Yeah, yeah. Oscillation has proposed the first experimental proposal to make this uh, wild semi metal. Transport So basically, what I mean is most of the students who are here must have done this very simple transfer transport effect, that is the Hall effect. So you measure what you do, they would take a piece of metal or semiconductor and pass a current and apply a magnetic field perpendicular to a sample and put a voltmeter like this and measure. Your, uh, now, the cinema is called resistivity, the measure of resistivity, which is usually a straight line because of a non magnetic material. And the slope here uh, tells you the you know, carrier density of uh, your sample. And this is the first, uh, most, uh, this is uh, the kind of transfer transport is paid. almost everybody must have done in the MSC bus. It's a very old experiment, it was done in 1880. This is almost 140 year old experiment. Uh, so, in case of magnetic material, you have to slightly modification. In case of magnetic material, you have another term of an, which is called anomalous hall resistivity. So, your anomalous hall resistivity as a function of magnetic field becomes nonlinear. And if you extrapolate the high current regions, then you can calculate your anomalous hall coefficient if you know the magnetization of the sample. So, this is a very old uh, experiment. This was also discovered by Edward Hall when he was in John Hopkins University. So, this experiment uh, was very old. So, the, uh, what is the physics behind this anomalous hall effect? Uh, the most popular model is Carpenter Schrodinger model, which was discovered and in, introduced in 1954. And whereas they introduced that there, in case of magnetic material, there is an anomalous, anomalous velocity, perpendicular direction of the current due to the magnetization, which causes the magnetic this anomalous hall effect. But, but with time, people have realized that uh, there are magnetic materials which are magnetization but does not show anomalous hall effect. And there are materials which are not magnetic but show the anomalous hall effect. So this concept of this uh, Carpenter Schrodinger model has been remodified, and now uh, we understand this anomalous hall effects uh, by uh, this very phase effects uh, as introduced by uh, Alan McDonald and Thomas Singer. So all these transfer transfer transport effects in these materials can be considered as a manifestation of very very phase effects. So now what is very phase? So let me introduce this thing. Before I introduce very phase, I would like to introduce what is topology because it is interesting to it is important to understand topology before you before you understand very phase. So I will give one simple example to introduce topology. Suppose you have two stripes, so one is bell stripe, other is a Mobius stripe, and you can see that this is a twist in this stripe. So it is no matter whatever you do, there are tilt or a twist or something, you cannot get rid of this twist over here. And the only way you can get rid of the twist is that you take a scissor, cut it up, and remove the twist and glue it back again then you will end up in this belt stripe. So you can see that uh, this belt stripe has a uh, pro property which is called twist number which is 0 and this obvious stripe has a property that is called 1, uh, twist number is 1. So topology means say, uh, topology is the theoretical property that cannot be changed through continuous deformation, twisting or stretching the object. So this twist number cannot be changed by, uh, by twisting or stretching this, uh, this uh, belt ring, belt stripe. Uh, similar in this case. So when you have this twist uh, number is 0, we call it a topological trivial set. For example, this is in a, a topological trivial set. And here we call it a topological non-trivial set. So now let's assume there is a crab. Okay, so there is a crab here. And this crab wants to work on this surface and on this surface. And let's see what happens actually. So to make one complete rotation of this bell stripe, what will happen is that this crab will make one complete rotation and come back to the same state after one complete, uh, one complete work. So you can see that uh, in a topological trivial surface, you move one complete loop, you come back to the exactly same state. But in a Mobius stripe, this is not that obvious. So let me show one animation over here. So you can see that this car is moving from here. Let's observe this point. This long arm is on this side. And after one complete rotation, you can see uh, this long arm on the right hand side. So that means if one makes one complete rotation on the surface, it across the phase difference of phi. It, it comes back to only the same state only after two rotations. So that means if you are moving in a topological non-trivial surface, you can accumulate phase, you make one complete loop. Uh, this is a two-dimensional case. 
what happens is the energy in three dimensions. This is what happens at the moment of space when your electrons are moving in k space, which is three dimensional space. So, uh, so what if you want complete loop, then you can accumulate an additional phase in your wave function, and we call it as a Berry phase, and which can be written as a vector quantity lying close to integral of a vector quantity. Uh, this vector quantity is called Berry function, which is defined like this, which is a exact analog of a vector potential in your electromagnetic theory. And uh, since uh, in equivalence to electromagnetic theory, you can define the power of this vector potential to the very curvature. And so I'll rewrite this uh, very phase using Stokes theorem we will give here. It is a line integral, so it will to the loop integral, so it will convert it to a surface integral. Then you can see that if you integrate your very curvature over the entire gravity zone, you will get a 2 pi times a integer. And this integer is called Chern number or topological index. So when it is non-zero, then you will have a topological material. When it is zero, it is a topological trivial material. Prasad, in the previous slide, just a light remark, the crack should go sideways. Yeah, so that I cannot create the animation to the light. <laughs> Thanks for pointing out. <laughs> so, you will notice that the, uh, if you calculate the velocity of the electron, uh, then after considering the very curvature, this is the first term, which basically is the slope of your dispersion relation. This is normal velocity. And the second term is a term which looks like a derivative of k, time derivative of k, cross product of the very curvature. So this looks like a uh, velocity, like a Lorentz force, velocity cross product of magnetic field. So you can see that very curvature has same effect in, as a magnetic field would do in a real space. So you can assume that very curvature is like a magnetic field in the real space, and we can produce transverse velocity similar to the magnetic field do in a real space. So, to observe large giant transverse effect, you need to have large very curvature. Uh, this is what I want to uh, take away. If you know the Hamiltonian of a system, then you can calculate the velocity operators, and you can calculate the very curvature by using, by taking this sum over here, with the, uh, which tells like the where n is the energizing function, block states, and n is the block wave functions. So, if you know the very curvature, then you can calculate the anomalous of conductivity by multiplying very curvature with Fermi direct distribution function and indicating over all entire gravity zone. And this is what the Kubo formula is, this is the formula is called Kubo formula. So in case of a wild semi-metal, what will happen is that so in case of wild semi-metal, these two wild points are the source and sink of very curvature. So the very curvature is extremely large close to these wild points. So if you will calculate this, uh, this integral, then you find that this number of solar conductivity becomes very, very large close to the wild points. So this is why in wild semi-metal, you are expected to be very large number of solar effect. There is another transverse effect that is called the spin hole effect. So, anomalous hole effect is a very old effect, it is 140 years old. So, if you do anomalous hole effect experiment now, that is nothing new because it is a very simple experiment. People know 100 years ago could do it. So, but spin hole effect is not a simple experiment, it is a very complicated experiment. Actually, spin hole effect was initially proposed in 1969 by Jack Noble and and it took almost 40 years uh, to realize it. And it was realized experimentally in 2004. So, what is this spin hole effect? Uh, in spin hole effect, what you do is that you take a piece of uh, heavy metal, for example platinum, and pass a current through it. So you can create a spin accumulation with, uh, uh, in this material, uh, as shown by this view that is over here. And this produces a spin current, which is virtually orthogonal to spin polarization direction and the spin current direction. And the magnitude of this spin current is given by this expression over here, where theta is for the spin hole case. This is also true. So suppose you have a, uh, you can, if you, if you inject the spin current into a piece of platinum, then you can create a charge current which will be which very orthogonal to spin current direction and spin polarization direction, and which magnitude will be given by this expression over here, the theta is again the spin out here. So these two effects are very most important effects in spin turnings because this effect you can create a spin current, whereas uh, in the inverse spin out effect you can detect spin current. To detect spin current, what you have to do is that you inject a spin current into the spin hole material and put your uh, produces corresponding charge current, you put a voltmeter and you can detect the uh, normal electric voltage using normal voltmeters. So, okay. so in case of a wild semi-metal, we have a large very curvature. So, in similar to the anomalous hole effect, we are also expected to observe a large spin hole effect because you have large very curvature at the wild points. But notice that in this case, we have a spin very curvature. It's slightly different from the previous expression because if you remember the previous expression, in the previous expression, we had uh, this velocity operator over here. But now, here you can see, here we have the spin current operator and the velocity operator. So it correlates the velocity operator to the spin current operator. So similarly, so this is what I have been doing last couple of years. 
I was trying to explore skin, skin hole effect in wild centimeters to see if we can see a large skin hole effect in different wild centimeters. Example how we can see a large skin hole effect in wild centimeters. So next time, which is an antithermagnetic wild centimeter. So, you can say that Yes. Yes, yeah, you do not need any magnetic material also to realize skin hall effect. So that is very very useful for metric situations when you don't have need a magnetic material to realize. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, the large very coverage and skin orbit coupling together provides this. So I will give one example system where we will say this is a magnetic in a different magnetic wires in metal. So I will like to give a brief overview of this material before I go to skin hall effect measurement in this material. Right? And this is a hexagonal structure. So you can consider this material as a collection of cardinal planes uh, which are stacked along the C axis of the material. And if you look into one of these cardinal planes, it looks something like this. So we have three magnetic atoms over here, and there is one thin atom over here, and the shaded area is the one unit cell. So what you will see here is that there are three magnetic atoms at 120 degrees, their spins are at 120 degrees with respect to each other. And so this kind of spin structure is called uh, non this kind of, is called inverse triangular spin structure. And since this is a non-polymer antiferromagnet, so ideally with an antiferromagnet you expect the magnetization to be zero. But uh, People found that this materials that the very tiny magnetic moment is 0 0.002 bore magnetron per magnetic atom. This we have discovered in the Satoru Nakasuji group in the University of Tokyo where I was working. So, although we found that this antiferro magnet is very very small magnetic moment, and it shows extremely large anomalous Hall effect, large anomalous Nash effect, large magnetic optical care effect. So, all these effects are only observed in ferromagnets. So, we were completely surprised why antiferro magnet will show such a large anomalous Hall effect. And also not effect in angular of the optical care effect. So to understand this thing further, so we did some angle region propagation spectroscopy experiment, and we found that in the bench structure of this material, uh, there are these white points, and all this transport transport effect can be explained from the large very curvature originating from these white points. There is another important concept here uh, in this non-collinear antiferromagnets, particularly manganese 13. So because it is antiferromagnets, so magnetization is zero. So this basically magnetization is not a good order parameter. So we have to find a good order parameter to describe this kind of non-collinear anti magnet. So recently in this paper, the people they have developed a new kind of moment that is called optical moment, which can describe the order parameter can be used as an order parameter to describe this kind of materials. So what is this optical moment? So if you look into three magnetic atoms in one carbon of layers, they are at 120 degree with respect to each other. And now if you look another carbon layer, the next neighbor carbon layer, so then you have another three magnetic atoms. They are at 120 degrees with each other, but they are at one at tilted by 180 degree. So you can see that this six magnetic atom total magnetic moment is zero, uh, but it has a finite optical moment, and this optical moment is the order parameter which aligns along this uh, mirror plane over here, aligns along this way. Some people also call it the ghost moment, that is why this ghost symbol is over here. So, so is in order to reverse the magnetization, we switch a magnetic field, then you can reverse the magnetization, but to reverse the optical moment. It is just slightly difficult. So what you have to do is that you have to reverse all these magnetic moments of all these magnetic atoms. Then you can reverse the direction of the optical moment. So we did some spin hole effect experiment in this material. We found a we discovered a completely new kind of spin hole effect, and we call it a magnetic spin hole effect. So let me explain what is magnetic spin hole effect. So we took a piece of magnetic spin material, and we aligned the optical moment in this direction, and we pass a charge current parallel to this optical moment direction. So due to the spin hole effect, there will be spin accumulation on the surface. So there will be spin accumulation due to two reasons. So one is due to ordinary spin hole effect. It's shown by this blue arrow over here. And there will be found, we found a completely new kind of spin accumulation on the surface, which is polar, spin polarization perpendicular to the surface. And the most interesting thing was when we reversed the optical moment directions, we found that the spin polarization produced due to the ordinary spin hole effect does not change the sign, but the spin polarization produced due to magnetic spin hole effect changes their sign. So this dark magnetic field, positive magnetic field compared to zero, so it will be like a different order for uh, one orientation. If come to negative direction and compared to zero, it will be very optical moment to be reversed. So switching the magnetic field. So what is the quantity or intensity of magnetic field? Yeah. 
Yeah, so that experiment I am coming in the next slide. So this will be the spin accumulation on the surface to do this thing. See this thing? Yeah. So I mean if I want to take a just as a simple test, you can get this special October moment. What sort of? So October moment actually is not possible to measure in like a school. What it offers is the optimal, like a magnetopical care effect. So one can see this in things to, uh, in the magnetopical care effect. Uh, so uh, people are trying to detect this optical domains because it is very different from magnetic domains. In magnetic domains there are this one domain which is a magnetization line. But in optical domains are much bigger than magnetic domains. And because these anti magnets, this domain dynamics is very interesting because it can uh, has a much, much faster frequency. It can work in So in magnetization measurements, it is not possible to detect. It's not possible to detect. Yeah, the normal speed measurements we cannot see this moment. Uh, speed measurements show just the residual moment, which is very very small, 0.0043 per okay. megaton. Okay. Okay. So the magnetic field. Yes, so we need a very large magnetic field. Particularly if you have bulk sample, uh, the bulk sample switches is kind of 300 milli tesla, but if you have thin films, it switches is much higher, than around one tesla. So if, in our case, some experiment are present which are done bulk samples, and some experiment are done in thin films. So I will show how we can switch this thing. Octopole moment is a better order parameter. Okay. In the previous slide you Yeah, so in the better order parameter, this, this kind of non-collinear anti-fermagnets. Yes. But compared to what is it a better parameter? Why do you call it a... Oh no, actually this is the only order parameter for this non-collinear. Because this non-collinear anti-fermagnet is a magnetization at zero. Which is magnetization kind of the order parameter. And this is not a collinear anti-fermagnet with a different name letter. It's the only order. This is the only order parameter. which is called magnetic spin hole effect and this was published in nature. So in this paper I did this direct spin hole effect experiment using this sample over here. This is a sample of manganese 3 team. We caught it by FIB and to make this device uh, using multi-step electron and lithium ion. So how do we measure these things actually? So we use a special kind of uh, technique we call a spin hole effect tunneling spectroscopy. So let me explain the uh, experimental method, how we measure spin hole effect in this materials. So what do you do is that, uh, let's start from platinum. Platinum is a good spin, spin, spin material. So in this case, you pass current through a platinum, then you can create spin accumulation on the surface. And now, if you put a uh, you want to detect the spin accumulation, what do you have to do with it? You put a ferromagnetic electrode on the top, separated by a tunnel barrier, and then you connect another non-magnetic material on the other side, and put a volt meter between these two. So now you can detect a spin accumulation on the surface. So in case of platinum, you will get this anti-clockwise loop. Now, if you replace this thing by a tantalum, then you will see that you will get a clockwise loop. And this is because tantalum and platinum has opposite spin hole again. So we did a similar experiment with manganese ring. So we put this manganese ring and put a permalloy ferromagnetic electrode. And when we align the optical moment in one direction, so we align the optical moment in a certain direction by applying large magnetic field in coming back to zero. And then we do, 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 do the switching of this permalloy electrode. Then we found this anti-clockwise loop over here. Uh, note that this permalloy can be switched in a very small magnetic field, whereas you need a very large magnetic field to switch the magnetic field. That's why you can independently switch the permalloy and magnetic field, and you can align your optical moment in certain direction. So now, what we found was that the spin accumulation direction is now reversed. So you can see that these two magnetic configuration has opposite spin on field. So this was a bit surprising to us. So if you change the magnetic configuration, we have a completely different loop. So we also cross-check this experiment by using no spin hole experiment in which we inject spin current to magnetic region and detect the corresponding generated voltage. So, so theta is 30 degree voltage, so let me explain the next slide. So we align the optimal moment in multiple directions. So we start from 0 degree, we define the 0 degree corresponds to the direction where uh, you have your, uh, the current in magnetic field and the current in and the optimal moments are parallel. And then we rotate in different angles. We found that 30 degrees the, 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 the spin signal becomes maximum over here. And it, it is very unusual because uh, this is spin hole effect. Spin hole effect should depend on only sine theta dependence. But it is not a sine theta dependence because that is peak at 30 degrees. So, in order to explain this thing, so theory was given by Alan McDonald and Watson. So, they developed a quantum kinetic theory they were, and they, they could be exactly reproduce this angular dependence uh, from their model. 
So in the interest of time, I will not go into this theory, but so you can see this paper for further details. This is for all multiple moments. So for particularly in this magnetic ring, we are considering only up to the optical moment because optical moment is supposed to be, somehow it is large in this material. But there are quadruple moment also there. Some material which is quadruple moment is large. So this is a multiple less concern. So this is there are higher order also there. But here, so what you will see is that you can detect a voltage. And note that this voltage doesn't appear because the charge current is flowing over here. So the charge current is flowing only in this circuit over here. So this voltage appears because of the non-equilibrium spin accumulation just below this detector electrode. So you can understand this thing like this. So here you apply electric, electric field, electric voltage, and you create a non-equilibrium spin accumulation. So the reverse process is also true. Suppose you have non-equilibrium spin accumulation, it will produce a voltage. And this is called spin junctions and since spin charge coupling. So this is why you detect a voltage. And now you can define the resistance, which is normalized to the current in the electrical circuit. We call it the non-local resistance. So now, in polarization along this direction, you can apply a large magnetic field and align your ferromagnetic injector electrode along this direction. Then you can uh, you can control this spin polarization directions by external magnetic field. So suppose you apply a large magnetic field along x direction and align your ferromagnet along this direction, you will get a finite non-local finite inverse spin resistance. Now if you reduce the magnetic field to zero, so what will happen is that because this is nanowire, so magnetization of the ferromagnetic will be aligned along the easy axis. So now in this case, you will not get any inverse spin of resistance. So that it is confirmed that you, whatever voltage you are measuring is coming from spin of effect and nothing else. And now the same thing will happen if you go to the negative side. So now the difference between these two signals, it all had uh, the inverse spin of signal. And if you know this magnitude of this inverse spin of signal, then you can determine spin of angle from this equation over here. And this bottom panel over here shows the NIMR curve of the formula in the so we usually do this two experiments simultaneously just to correlate the spin polarization direction with the, the inner spin hub directions. So how to use this kind of device to study spin hub effect? So to study spin hub effect, what you have to do is that to take your non-local spin hub device and measure your spin signal. So your spin signal will look something like this. Now, if you put a spin hub material in the middle, so what will happen is that some of the spin current will get absorbed by your spin hub material. And now, if you measure the spin signal again, then what you will see that spin signal will be reduced. And from this reduction of the spin signal, then you can determine the spin resistance of your spin hole material, and which is expressed like this over here. And if you know the resistivity of a material and dimension of this nanowire, then you can determine the spin diffusion length of the material. So after, the, after this actually, you can do the spin hole effect experiment, which we do by a special technique, we call it a spin adjustment method. So as I said, some of the spin current were absorbed by this nanowire, so now if you put a voltmeter across the spin hole material, then you should detect a voltage. But you will not detect a voltage in all conditions because uh, we know that spin current, charge current, spin polarization direction are visually orthogonal to each other. So you will detect a voltage only when the spin polarization is pointing along this direction over here. So uh, to all the experiment. Key reason behind this. Uh, and also the fact that you don't get a scientific effect here. So what's happening here? Yeah, so the main thing is that uh, the magnetic configurations, uh, usually normal spin hole effects should not depend on the magnetic configurations. But here we could see that if you change the magnetic configurations from optical moment this direction to other directions, you will completely change the loop direction. And this is measuring the spin hole signal. So basically the spin hole angle is somehow different from this configuration and the other configuration. So this is not expected in other magnetic materials. If you do the same experiment for iron or cobalt. So what's happening? So what's happening? Is there something uh, happening with the very phase or what? Yeah. So the very curvature is changing its sign. Ah. So in the magnetic because the total Hamilton is the spin part, right. and the spin part is different when you might change the magnetic configuration. So the very curvature changes sign when you change the magnetic configuration. Okay. So there is a magnetic configuration strongly related to the very curvature. In fact, you do the same experiment in low temperature. So this inverse triangular spin structure is realized at room temperature. So if you pull down this magnetic field below 250 Kelvin, this magnetic structure is destroyed. So then we measure the same experiment. We did not see any spin hole effect. So this spin hole effect is very strongly related to this inverse triangular spin structure. Also, the spin hole effect related to the spins are in plane or outer plane. In this magnetic field, all the spins are in plane. And as soon as this pull down, the spins are tilting out of the plane. 
and then it just keeps up to the best value and still signal this disappears. So up to now, what I presented was done in a bulk sample. We, we took a single question of bulk sample, very high quality sample, got it done by FIB, and we did this experiment, spinal effect experiment. Then we could also fabricate thin films of this material using ruthenium with a buffer layer, and we could group polycrystal and samples. Uh, our films are mostly oriented along the C axis, and there were, you can see from this peak here, over here, the strong peak, the 00, 00 peak was very strong, and the films are very, very smooth, uh, but with the polycrystal and film. And the big difference between polycrystal film and single crystal film is that it will measure the anomalous fall effect, uh, the switching capacity is quite large to layer and one tesla, whereas in a single crystal samples, uh, the switching is very small, really, you need around 30 million tesla to switch your uh, single crystal samples. We really don't understand why it is like this, so we assume that this multi grain domain uh, nature might have something to do with it. And also, another big difference is that the total amount of anomalous fall conductivity in this bulk sample is. 100 or Siemens per centimeter, and in thin films, it's slightly smaller, around 60 Siemens per centimeter. And also, if you do the temperature dependence of anomalous fall effect, and the thin films, we found that this anomalous fall effect disappears exactly around 260 Kelvin, because at this point, this inverse triangular spin structure is destroyed. So, anomalous fall effect is observed only when the inverse triangular spin structure is stabilized. We can spin out an experiment using a nanoscale device. And I particularly specialize in this non-local spin hole devices. So let me introduce this device before I go to the actual spin hole effect experiment. So what is a non-local spin hole device? So then this device looks something like this. We have a thermagnetic nanowire over here, and there is a non-magnetic nanowire basing these two thermagnets. And this device is made in three different states by electron the lithography. So how does this device work? Let me explain it. So in this device, suppose you apply a voltmeter, apply a battery with this thermagnet and the copper. You can inject spin polarized current into your copper. So because of this spin polarized injection, so the, the electrochemical potential of the copper will be split like this over here, and there will be non-equilibrium spin accumulation over here. And this non-equilibrium spin accumulation will diffuse on the both sides, and it will create a spin current. And we define the spin current like this over here, where it is actually gradient of the electrochemical potential along the x-axis over here. Or similar to electrical current, you can also define electrical voltage. You can define spin voltage, which is the, like defined like this. And similar to electrical resistance, you can define a quantity called spin resistance, which is defined like this, which depends on spin equation length, sensitivity of a material, uh, area cross section of a material, and spin polarization. This has similar equ equivalence of electrical resistance, but for spin currents. So, so what you do is then you pass current through your spin material, and it creates spin accumulation inside this copper, which will diffuse and you can detect non locally using your voltmeter between the ferromagnet and this copper. So, in this case, you will get a reverse signal. And, and this is because the, uh, the, the spin hole effect measured by direct spin hole effect should be equal to the spin hole angle measured by inverse spin hole effect due to the obstacle basic situation. So, this is the only experimental method in which you can study both direct spin hole effect and inverse spin hole effect in the same device. So, uh, there is no other experimental technique where you can do the same thing in the same device. So, I use the same technique to study the spin hole effect in manganese in nanowires. So, this is the device that I use to study this Spin hole effect in magnetic nanowire. So this is your non-local spin hole device, and this purple line over here shows the nanowire of magnetic field. So this is around 260 nanometer wide and 70 nanometer thick. So we might think that what is so special about this thing? So main difficulty part of it is that magnetic field uh, making a nanowire magnetic field is very very experimentally challenging. So most of the time when you make these nanowires, they are not uh, in a stoichiometric magnetic field, or they can also easily oxidize. So it took almost two years to optimize this nanowire for me to uh, have a good quality nanowire. So to confirm this quality of nanowire, so what do you do is that you make a hot bar next to this uh, device and you measure anomalous fall effect in this, in this device. So if you found that if you measure the anomalous fall effect in this device next to this device, you can see anomalous fall effect in room temperature, and this anomalous fall effect disappears at 150 Kelvin, which is what one should expect for magnetic thin. So after confirming that this nanowire is magnetic thin, uh, then we move to the next step. So please note that there is a bit of uh, difference between manganese heating, and stoichiometry manganese heating, and this temperature dependence of resistivity. Because stoichiometry manganese heating is completely metallic. Here you can see there is a two transition over here. This is typical that happens when you have a slightly up stoichiometry manganese heating. Uh, that I may uh, experimental later might get 10 Kelvin to be around almost close to 1 micron. The spin diffusion length is less than a nanometer. And then you are doing a length dependent study by changing the length and looking at the exponential decay of the signal. 
when the spin diffusion length is so small, why does the length dependence show anything at all? Yes, yeah, so that's a good point. Actually, uh, there is a uh, like uh, clarify here. Actually, the so this experiment is only for copper. Obviously, when the spin diffusion less than the canon, under the canon, this kind of experiment. So the spin diffusion length we do not determine by this method by increasing the distance between these two. We determine by uh, by the reduction of the signal. So if we how much the ratio of the signal, how much the spin signal got reduced, we from this ratio we can calculate the spin resistance of your material. Okay, but this method was necessary because that spin diffusion length was very yes, small. Yes, yes. So all the most of the spin material has very small spin diffusion length. Because it would calculate the material four nanometers or something like that. So you have to only use this method. This is distance density method cannot work. Distance method works only for copper, silver, or graphene, which is large spin diffusion length. So this is the only method to determine spin diffusion length. Uh, there are other methods, but this is the one of the methods to determine spin diffusion length. Visibility of these microscopic equations when the distances are so short. They are comparable to so many atomic distances. They yeah, so the, actually the equation yeah. itself. So the, the, here in my case it is around 0.75 nanometer, which is actually almost the thickness of the one carbon layer. So the, as soon as it comes in, it gets absorbed, dissipated in the first carbon layer. So it doesn't go below next layers. But will the equations uh, be accurate at that length scale that we can exactly predict 0.75? Or we can say it is at the limit of applicability of equations? Yeah, so, uh, so you can see that there is a large error in my data actually here. And so uh, there is a very large, large amount of error. Uh, so this is because of experimental error, but we have to see that you can measure, uh, you can see the error is almost close to your actual value. Uh, so but if you do the same experiment for platinum, you can determine that you know, almost 4 nanometers or some, something that is la larger than 4 nanometers, you can determine this number much more. On the lower error bar, it is 0.1 nanometer. 0.1 nanometer, like an angstrom, one atom. Yeah, so this is this is because this is the experimental method gets noisy because uh, the data is very noisy. So if you can measure this voltage much more accurately, then you can improve this uh, accuracy. But more or less, uh, if, you, if the spin diffusion length is almost one nanometer higher, you can very well determine this using this method spin diffusion length. We have successfully used all heavy metals, platinum, tantalum, niobium, everything. So using this method, and we found it very matches with other methods also. In this kind of materials. So uh, that is uh, one concept to mix gravitational anomaly. So what I can say is that if you have a strong gravitational field, the chirality, the conservation chirality is halved. So uh, you can see that if there is a gravitational field gradient, then you, you can, uh, the, the total uh, chirality is not conserved. And this was actually, then how to create a gra gravitational field gradient in your sample? Because in the lab, we are doing experiments in the lab in a small, small sample. Obviously, you cannot create a gravitational field gradient in your sample. Because, uh, so the way you can get rid of this thing is that gravitational gradient comes from big growth. So we call it as the, uh, the temperature gradient, it's the role of a gravitational field gradient. So if you have a temperature gradient and there are chiral fermions, you can assume that the for a chiral fermions are moving in a gravitational field gradient. And this is what people have observed recently. So if you have temperature gradient and magnetic field parallel to each other, then you can see the conductivity of sample increases as you increase the magnetic field. This is because there is a pumping of parallel fermions from one point to other point, similar to parallel anomaly And this kind of high energy concepts can be studied in this kind of wild fermion metals. So this is also uh, quite exciting to aspects of this wild fermion metal studies. Okay, now I would like to conclude my talk. So thank you everyone for your attention, sir. And I would like to thank Professor Sushita Adani and our collaborators and all our lab mates who have involved in this experiment. So now I'm going to question. Similar to the similar to your electrical resistance. So the it is defined like this. So, so this is your spin resistance. So there is not also uh, this is just normal property of the spin current. Like electrical resistance, we have the spin resistance. So it depends on spin diffusion length, and this is electrical resistance, and the dimension of the material is spin polarization of the material. So 
you can see like some material has a large it is very counterweight to be for example copper there is a large steel resistance uh, whereas there is a lower electrical resistance this is because the steel resistance is very large Means uh, for copper actually, if your copper spin tolerance is zero, but if you somehow have you some diet magnetic semiconductor or something, you can control the spin tolerance. Then in that material, this becomes uh, this is general definition of spin resistance. Can magnetic spin be from the change? Yeah. Most of the time, people change the resistivity. This is like easy to control because you can do something and resistivity change. And so it's much easier to control the resistivity than the spin tolerance experimentally. So to measure the spin hole effect, we may make the same technique. We make your reference normal for spin hole device and measure your spin signal. And then uh, you put your spin hole device and measure your spin signal. You can see the spin signal got reduced. This measurement was done at 10 Kelvin. And from this reduction, you can actually calculate your spin diffusion length uh, from this expression over here. And I did the same experiment at room temperature and calculated the spin diffusion length is very, very small, around 0.75 nanometers in my magnetism. This is typically happens in antifer magnets. Spin current cannot travel too long. In well, most of the anti magnets are spin current if you less than one nanometer. So, the next two is to measure the spin hole effect. So, now we put the voltmeter along this direction. And so, in this case, you detect the voltage. So, when you align the large magnetic field and control the spin polarization direction of the spin current, then you will get a finite uh, uh, inverse spin hole resistance. Now, if you reverse your spin current direction, you will get another spin hole inverse spin hole resistance. And the difference between these two resistance is called as inverse spin hole signal. And from this, I could determine the spin hole angle to be around 5 percent. So this uh, this is actually quite large. And if you will do the same kind of experiment with platinum, you will get almost similar spin hole angle. So also I could calculate the spin hole conductivity, which is around 47 ohm centimeter. So if this is quite comparable to theoretical predictions. For people are predicting theoretically around 36 to 96 7 ohm centimeters. So you can see that although I was I had a very poor quality magnetic thing, which was polycrystalline and uh, slight drops of MSC, I could get a very large spin hole connectivity compared to the theoretical prediction. So this is quite advantageous because you don't have to make a very high quality nanowires to make your device. And then if you make a very poor quality nanowires, still you can get large, uh, large spin hole connectivity uh, for applications. This is why I this is because it is a topological as well as symmetry. And this inverse triangular spin structure is all co-planar. So actually the scalar spin parallelity, which is basically you define the scalar spin parallelity is like So this is the scalar spin character which is needed to observe a real space magnetic configuration. So here the spins are all in the the scalar spin character is zero. So that's why uh, at room temperature we do not see this real space very curvature or anything. All this very curvature comes from the moment of stress only. But if you pull down to below 260 Kelvin, the spins start rotating around each other and you get a spiral helical spin stage. And here then you can uh, go to helical state, still there is implant. So, still the scalar spin current is zero, but if you go below 50 Kelvin, then you start tilting and you get a finite spin scalar spin current. And you can see topological hall effect and uh, all the magnetic configuration structures there. So, uh, the main reason why it is implant is because uh, this, uh, this structure is stabilized by DMI plus in excel magnetic anisotropy. And the DMI is much stronger than the rectangular anisotropy. So, that's why this, this, all these things are implant. The gravitational gradient, the gravitational gradient, how do you create a type of small size of sample? Yeah, let me explain the technology. Thanks for watching. So, actually, the way you define temperature is like if you have a flat space time, then temperature is uniform. But if you have a curved space time, you get a gradient of the space time. If you have strong gravitational space, space time will bend, the temperature is not constant anymore. Because this is different from the definition of temperature as introduced by this guy a long time back. So they said that if you have a temperature gradient and there are chiral formulas in order to influence the temperature gradient, it is almost equivalent to that the gravitational field gradient. This is like a big gradient. Only for chiral formulas. Only for chiral This is not for normal vectors. There has to be chiral formulas under the influence of temperature gradient, then only you can uh, consider the analog environment in which there is a gravitational field gradient. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, so in this state, actually, we have not done spin hull effect measurements. So maybe it will be interesting to consider spin hull effect experiment on this kind of magnets. And there, you can, I can also control this continuous effect linear by applying external magnetic field compared to this inverse triangular structure. It is very, very stable and not difficult to control external magnetic So people have done this thing by neutron detection experiment, uh, but uh, from transport experiment also it is visible. For example, when the two kids take the yeah, the moments are very small. So it's not possible to do by normal speed measurements. Uh, so it's uh, only one can see the transport signatures or some neutron detection experiment to see this magnetic condition. Uh, because now, yeah. So because here the uh, the moment of stress vector also disappear because the spin structure is um, changed. So. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so there was a bit of controversy about this magnetic structure. When we, this Nakashoji group they started working on this material, there were many papers with different magnetic contributions uh, proposed. So we have to send our samples to find out uh, the, what is the right magnetic contribution. And we found out this, this is the 120 degree contribution at room temperature is the right one. So. The parallel, if you measure the non local resistance, it will be positive non local resistance. And when these two ferro magnets are anti parallel, this non local resistance, you get a negative non local resistance. And this difference between these two resistances is called the spin signal. So, this kind of device is used to, can be used to determine this experimentally the spin diffusion length of any material. So, suppose uh, spin diffusion length is the distance of two feet spin per second traveling inside a material. So, for example, if you make a non-local spin hull device with the injector and integral separation by D, then you measure your spin signal, it will look something like this over here. Now, if you increase your distance to be a larger distance, then your spin signal will be reduced. And if you make many, many devices like this one, and plot your distance as a function of spin signal, you can see that the spin signal decays exponentially, and by doing exponential feed, you can determine the spin diffusion in the of your material. For example, I saw different kind of spin hull effects. So one spin hull effect is magnetic spin hull effect, which was a completely new spin hull effect. So we saw in simulation samples. And in qualitational samples, we saw that even if you make a very poor quality magnetic ring, you can see you get large spin hull conductivity and you can do magnetic spin hull material in, in industry skills. But before I go next, I would like to explain uh, what I plan to do, what is my outlook, what I am planning to do next couple of years, what is the physics problem that I want to address. So I just said at the beginning. So I, I want to uh, study different kind of oxide thin wire cell metals and 2D materials wire cell metals, uh, both thin films and devices. So what I want to do is that I want to create a current of wire fermions uh, and try to make electronic devices using currents made of uh, chiral currents instead of steam currents. So we can do that by this current of chiral anomaly effects. So what is this anomaly effects? So in, in wire cell metal there are these two Dirac cones, and if you apply magnetic field, the Dirac cones fit into Landau level, and because it's a linear dispersion, there is zero Landau level, and which is actually uh, uh, almost one dimensional. So in this uh, close to this cone, there, there are only left hand parallel fermions, and close to this uh, this white point, there are only right hand parallel fermions. So now, if you apply the electric field parallel to the magnetic field, then what will happen is that the, uh, the left hand parallel fermions will bump to the right hand parallel fermions, and this will produce an additional current in your sample. So this will produce additional current, so the distance of sample will go down. So this is what we have seen in experiments. So if you apply electric current and magnetic current, um, electric field and magnetic current parallel to each other, the resistance goes down, and as soon as you apply magnetic field away from the current directions, you get a normal positive magnetic resistance, which is expected in the metal or semiconductors. So by applying current parallel to magnetic field, you can create a current, uh, which is a parallel current. So there have been a lot of device proposals to explore how we can explore this kind of current. So one of the devices is by this one, S.A. Parameshwaran. So he proposed that if you can make a thin slab of a wire cell metal and apply electric field and magnetic field parallel to it one end of the sample, then you can create a parallel current which will diffuse along this wire and if you put a voltmeter on the other end, you can detect this parallel current. So this kind of parallel currents are actually topologically protected. So they can travel a long distance, okay, up to several microns. So if you can detect this kind of current, you can create a equivalent electronics similar to spin tronics. So we will call this chiral tronics or wire tronics. So this is what I want to fabricate this kind of devices uh, using wire cell metals uh, to create new kind of devices. 
So, so there are much more promising aspects of this kind of uh, experiments. One thing is that you can create a loop of a bulk semi-metals, and it has been theoretical basically proposed that you can create a new kind of qubit, so we call it the chiral qubit. So in this qubit, uh, where it is similar to a superconducting qubit, so here what happens is that if the current is circulating in the clockwise direction, then you will, you will get this left hand current formulas, uh, it is a zero state, and the one state will be defined as uh, when the current current is circulating in the opposite direction. And when you have the exactly half plus quantum flow this, uh, this loop, you can create a superposition state between these two states. And this kind of qubits is very much needed because this qubits will work at room temperature and it will work at very high speed, it will work at uh, terahertz frequencies, which is not possible in superconducting qubit. Because in superconducting qubit, it works at only at gigahertz, because superconducting gap has a couple of millilectron volt gap. So if you can realize this kind of qubits, actually you can make quantum computer at room temperature, this should be revolutionary. So this is what uh, the main goal of this kind of research is. And the Yeah. yeah, so the, uh, this very good question. Thanks for this question. So let me come to that slide. So actually, as uh, you pull down, actually, uh, the, the single ion isotropy becomes stronger compared to the DM extent. Okay. Uh, so then actually then the speeds are getting uh, away from the plane. And when, when is the last? Uh, actually, this, this, uh, uh, this is not confirmed to be a heavy exactly configuration like this, because there might be some kind of a uh, random orientation. There will be finite scalar variety, but uh, it's not very uh, uniform, actually. There are some Fluctuations around here. So. Can I ask something related to the last question? So, what about systems with like topological uh, or like scorpions? I mean, can you do similar things in scorpions? Yeah, then also in topological scorpions, there are real case studies in real space very provisional. So, in that case, also one can see slabs in our effect in scorpions also. Uh, it's like it's challenging, but it's possible to do. You know, look at even the real space very curvature. In uh, scorpions or other non-collinear, uh, like a magnet, where there's finite real space very curvature. Like, anyhow, it has to spin, it has to be out of the plane. 